my God, they're really coming in. You yeah. guys can start adding things to the chat whenever you want. If it's yeah. like a resource that you're going to come back to. Yeah, now that we've got folks in the room, feel free to add things to the chat. Um, welcome <clears throat> everyone to this installment, this week's installment of our Fighting Back Lessons from AIDS for COVID-19 series. Uh, today's conversation is going to be picking up where we left off and kind of digging more into the topic of um, the role of art and artists during a pandemic. We brought all these lovely people together before for our second ever uh, installment on this series in what we just discussed, you know, feels like a, a whole world ago. Um, and so we're excited to continue tonight. Um, I'm Lee Pfeffer. I am the Museum Operations Manager at the GLBT Historical Society, and I curate the programs. Um, and so tonight I'm just going to give you a little bit of housekeeping if this is one of your first uh, Zoom webinars, um, let you know how you can interact, and then I'll hand it over to Terry, who will introduce all of our panelists and start the conversation. So tonight we're doing this as a webinar. So um, you'll be, you should be able to see all of us as as panelists, and you can um, you can see us either in speaker view or grid view if you want to see all of our faces. Um, you can also utilize the chat if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen and you hover over the bottom center. You should have a couple of different options in how to interact. You should be able to see the chat button. You can see um, you can see the Q and A button and raise hand. Uh, the chat, please feel free to put uh, any comments you would like in that. Um, that is a place for folks to put links and resources to talk amongst yourselves as attendees as you're listening to the panelists. Um, please, you know, just keep it uh, appropriate and make sure that if you want to send a message to everyone and have everyone be able to see it, you have to select to everyone um, and not just to all panelists. Otherwise, it'll no. only be us who see it. That being said, if you want to send a private message to just the panelists, you can do that as well. Um, we'll talk for about an hour and then we will move it over hour, hour 15. The conversations tend to shift and change, but we will move over to kind of a formal Q&A section. And we'll be using the Q&A function in Zoom. So if you click the little button that says Q&A, it looks like two chat bubbles next to one another. You can type a question in and then we'll be able to have it in our queue and we'll be able to um, uh, go through and select the questions that we're going to answer. Uh, please feel free to send questions through that function throughout the entire evening. Don't feel like you have to wait until we open up the Q&A. Um, and please, if you can, um, avoid trying to ask the questions in the chat because sometimes it can get um, pretty uh, overwhelming and, and it's hard to scroll back through there. So if you can do it through the question and answer, please do. If you are unable to type out your question and you need to um, ask your question or make a comment verbally, you can press the raise hand button and that will tell me the uh, host of this meeting. I will be able to see that you want to say something and we can uh, unmute you during the Q&A section. Um, and uh, you may have also noticed uh, already we have some information in the chat that our panelists have put in some resources and links um, that we'll be discussing through the evening. And if you have any questions too, I'll be kind of hanging out in the background, feel free to just private message me and I'm gonna be uh, tech moderating the conversation. So with that, I would like to hand it over to our executive director and moderator for tonight, Terry Beswick. Great, thanks Lee for putting this together tonight and welcome everyone, I'm so excited to have you all back um, at the Fighting Back series. Uh, this is a series that we started after the inauguration of the current president. And we decided that we wanted to uh, bring together intergenerational panels to talk about um, contemporary social justice issues in a historic context. And so this has really been going on for a few years. It's just in the last several weeks that we uh, went online with it, of course and went to a weekly format and focused specifically on what can we learn from AIDS history that can help us to get uh, through and survive the uh, COVID crisis. Um, 
So tonight, uh, we're I'm especially excited to bring together this group because it's uh, I'm hoping going to become sort of like a, a little uh, arts think tank, and we're going to get together periodically. Um, you know, maybe in a year we'll get together and reflect on what we said today and and last month. Um, a really great group, um, and I thought a very interesting discussion last month, and so we wanted to come back together. I felt like last month we were uh, really early in the pandemic and we were just trying to get a handle on how, you know, we were personally going to get through and, you know, uh, just beginning to think about artistic responses to the pandemic um, and how that relates to our experiences with AIDS. So I think uh, tonight we're going to be able to reflect a little bit more on our most recent experience. So I want to introduce our, our speakers first and then we're going to go around and do uh, some uh, discussion of uh, what er, uh, everyone's work has been in relationship to AIDS and COVID as uh, an artist or as a curator. And then we're going to talk specifically about AIDS um, and how it had affected and continues to affect uh, the arts uh, culture and community and artists. Um, and then focusing in more specifically around COVID and what people are seeing now um, happening in the artistic world and what you are working on specifically. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our speakers. Um, Joseph Abadi's work uh, addresses social identity and the human condition. In 2017, Abadi had his first solo ex exhibit at Strut, presenting a collection of portraits of San Francisco drag queens made into tapestries titled Larger Than Life. Later in 2017, he was invited to exhibit his work at the office of Senator Scott Wiener in the State of California building in San Francisco for Pride Month. He then started curating on a regular basis for the Senator's office and promoting the work of San Francisco Bay Area artists. Queries, Joseph Avadi's exhibit at Strut in March and April, 2020. I believe it's still up actually, and he's got it as his yeah. background. <laughs> it's his inquiry on the masculine figure and the forms of expression from a queer point of view. The paintings in this exhibit reveal masculine forms depicting queer identity, kinks, and beauty. Uh, Lenore Chin is a painter, photographer, and cultural activist who worked to create structures of personal and institutional support that both sustain critical artistic production and advance movements for social justice. Portraiture, both in painting and photography, is at the core of her visual art practice. Her current street photography chronicles a rapidly changing socio-political landscape. A San Francisco native, she was a founding member of Lesbians and Visual Arts, a co founder of the Queer Cultural Center and has been active in the Asian American Women Artists Association since, since the group was founded. Katie Connery has served as the Tenderloin Museum's executive director since 2016 and has cemented TLM's identity as a destination for community-based historically inspired arts programs with a dynamic vision for the neighborhood centric, diverse programs that bring people together from all walks of life. Along with weekly public programming and exhibitions, she led TLM's production of two major critically acclaimed performance projects, the Compton's Cafeteria Riot play and the tender aerial dance with flyaway productions. E.G. Crichton is an interdisciplinary artist who lives in San Francisco. She is Emeretta Professor of Art at UC San Francisco, uh, Santa Cruz and has served as artist in residence for the GLBG Historical Society. Her work uses a range of art strategies to explore social issues in history. And she often collaborates with visual artists, performers, writers, scientists, composers, and others. Her work has been exhibited in Asia, Australia, Europe, and across the United States. Leo Herrera is a Mexican self-taught visual artist, activist, and writer based in San Francisco. His work focuses on the American queer experience, politics, and history. His short viral films have been seen by millions. I think viral is a double one, Chandra, I'm not sure. Featured in global media outlets and museum exhibits. Leo's current passion project is Fathers, a sci-fi documentary web series and multimedia project that examines the world if AIDS never existed and a generation had lived. Leaving real life events, survivor histories and fictionalized events, Fathers creates a surreal vision of an alternative universe. So with that, again, welcome everyone to the panel tonight. Um, we've got about an hour and uh, before uh, we're going to open it up to questions uh, from the audience, hopefully we'll get a good stimulating discussion. This is pretty informal. 
But um, I do want to go around the room first and just give everyone a chance to talk a little bit about your work um, in uh, with re in relationship to art, specifically around AIDS and or COVID, or just generally in the community. Um, so, Leo, your face just popped up. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've been working on Fathers for about five years now. It's a web documentary series that examines the world if um, AIDS never existed. And so it sort of um, creates an alternate universe where the epidemic didn't take a generation of artists and activists and imagines what we could have, what they could have and what we could have created without the uh, lost resources and lost lives of that epidemic. Um, right now, it's a very strange time to have tried to promote that project. Uh, I think we spoke last time about how COVID was affecting um, all of our art exhibits and pretty much every film festival has been canceled this year. So it's been taking a lot of pivoting to figure out how to um, fit that project um, into this current, in these current events. So there's some really strange dovetailing that's been going on um, and some really difficult decisions as an artist to make. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. Um, E.G., can you talk to us a little bit about your work? Sure. Um, I'm um, a visual artist, and I actually, when AIDS was really um, coming into our awareness and at its height, I was just starting to become an artist. Um, I was a late bloomer, and you know, I was going back to college to get a degree for the first time and um, started working for a magazine called Outlook. And I actually started looking at it today and remembered a project from the AIDS era called 100 Legends that um, was this beautiful cloth bound portfolio with art. And by the time it actually got published, uh, a lot of the people had already died who contributed to it. Um, but anyway, that's something that I worked on in the context of Out Outlook magazine. So I, I feel like my art career began in that epidemic and now it's morphing into writing. I'm mostly doing writing right now, a little bit of drawing, but I'm working on, I'm writing about a project I did with the Historical Society called Lineage Matchmaking in the Archive. And um, so I'm revisiting the people that participated in that, um, who I matched to an archive and, and the work that they created. Um, so that's pretty, and, I, and I'm writing a, day, a, a kind of plague journal that I send out to about 40 people. So that's also something particular to now that I never thought I'd be doing. Day 57, I think. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I kind of do that on Facebook, but I think it's a good sort of self-care practice as well. Uh, maybe just to um, express yourself on a daily basis. It'll be interesting to look back on. Um, Lenora, can you talk to us a little bit about your work? In the past, I was primarily known as a painter, uh, although I did photography along the way, and the photography was uh, usually the, um, the source of my paintings. I would take photos and they would become portraits. Um, so I would say probably over a 30 year plus period, I was uh, painting a lot of um, people in my circle. And as it turned out, um, I ended up chronicling the queer community over that period of time. So it started with some earlier portraits, I would say around the late 70s maybe, and then uh, went through the early 80s uh, when some of my friends were beginning to get sick uh, with a disease that had yet to have a, a name. Um, and then a little bit later, uh, some of them ended up to be um, uh, commemorations of domestic partners relationships before marriage equality came into being. Uh, and then it went on up to uh, where we were starting to see um, some of my friends were passing away. And, uh, and so, so it kind of it shows over a period of time benchmarks in the um, history of our community. Uh, and um, 
uh, then eventually I started shifting over to, uh, to photography. Um, and in more recent uh, weeks, since we went into shutdown and since our last um, talk, uh, I actually finally got out. I, I don't get out that much these days. Normally I'm out and about, as you know, I'm on the streets taking pictures, cultural events, political events, uh, a lot of your openings at the GLBT History Museum. And um, so I've created a whole separate body of work there. But with the shutdown, um, I've really cut back, rarely go out. Um, at, I find myself busy as ever doing things like this. But I did one day go out um, uh, to do an errand and I had to walk through the Castro to get to the Wells Fargo because the, the one at uh, Safeway is closed, it's too small. So I walked down there and it was such an eerie sight. It was like a ghost town because there was no traffic, hardly any people at all. Um, they were just starting to board up the box office at the Castro Theater. Um, I had to wait in outside before they would let me in to the bank. Um, and then I kept, you know, taking pictures along the way as I was, uh, you know, I had my mask on, my gloves on, all that. Then about a week later, I went through the Castro again because I had to pick up shoes from the cobbler up the block from you guys. Um, this time he was able to put a bench across his front door. That's the only way he could kind of keep his business open because the place is so tiny, you can barely fit one person. By then, uh, the box office at the Castro was completely covered with uh, plywood planks. And, and now there's art around there. Uh, I, I noticed that the museum, your museum was also boarded up and I heard there had been some graffiti uh, happening there. And um, so, but the whole area is like any business that was not open seemed to have their windows boarded up. So I took pictures of all of that. Whoops, where's the mute? There's mine. Great, thanks, Lenora. I'm gonna <laughs> go. Uh, we're gonna come back. So uh, Joseph, can you talk to us a little bit about your work? Yes. Um, um, during this time, I just installed a, a painting. I've been painting lately, the last few years. Uh, it's been my major um, means of doing visual art. And I can share something, if I can get the screen up. Um, there. So I just installed this. Um, this is my painting of Harvey Milk uh, for the windows for Harvey this year. Um, I've been working on a lot of these very blocked contour paintings. And when I started this painting, I actually did have his features in there. And then as I was kind of working with it and kind of removing it, I, I realized that without the features, I could immediately recognize this as being Harvey. And I shared this with some other friends and I, before I even told them what I was doing, I said, well, who, who do you think this is? Or what do you think? And everyone said, oh, that's Harvey, you know? And so um, I was really pleased with, with the way this came out. Um, and, I, and I call this icon because He's become such an icon or a hero within uh, the LGBTQ uh, community that um, even without the features, there's a certain profile and there's a certain stance to him that I think is strong enough, you know, from a graphic perspective to, um, to become iconic. And so, that was something I just installed this past this past week on Monday, and and then besides that, and this is just another view of it. Um, so I was really happy to do that, and I'm looking forward to seeing what other people have done. And um, because it's in the strut window, um, it has and it's not boarded up there. Um, it has good visibility to the community um, and people are walking the street. So I'm hoping that, you know, it does get some kind of um, uh, 
exposure while it's up there for the rest of the month. Um, Great. And then um, outside that, I've also been working on, um, I think during this period of time, I, I've been doing a lot of little studies, um, smaller paintings, just like 12 inch panels, round panels. Um, sometimes uh, as I'm doing those, I'm also kind of reappropriating uh, their meaning um, from what they were. Um, being in this, in this period of time, this COVID-19 time, um, and people using face masks, I'm, I'm using some of my images and kind of renaming them for this period of time, even though initially I didn't do it that way, but it just seems like in this period of time, um, by reappropriating my own work and giving them new names, it just kind of makes sense for what I'm mm. doing right now. Mm. Great. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, and hopefully we can talk some more about that. Uh, Katie, talk to us. Unmute. Myself, I see. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, as a curator, uh, my work has changed in order to find new safe ways of sharing art and creating the shelter in place virtual show, which I talked about last time and we're going to share some images of today. Um, that was the most accessible, immediate and safe way to share artwork. And I think in the future, we're going to be innovating new ideas about how to utilize outdoor space and also innovating new ideas about how to um, financially support artists as well. Um, I do understand why the arts is still considered non-essential, <laughs> but we are essential. <laughs> and I think you'll see lots of examples this evening about how essential the arts are always, but particularly now. And I think the real question is how do we safely share art with each other in innovative new ways? Great. Um, thank you all for uh, that kind of um, summary. I think um, now I just want to plunge in. Let's talk a little bit about AIDS first, uh, specifically, and you know, just whatever comes to mind or, or whatever thinking that you've been doing, especially through the prism of COVID uh, nineteen. Um, and just thinking back, you know, to the early years of the AIDS epidemic again, you know. Um, and into the 90s, uh, the kind of impact that AIDS had on our collective psyche, on the zeitgeist, whatever you want to call it, um, and how that manifested in our in our lives, um, and in our uh, organizations, our communities, our culture, um, and how uh, that that pandemic um, influenced art. Um, actually well past the 90s, even into the last 20 years. And so, um, and into today. Um, so can somebody talk up to me about that? You know, how, how, do, you, how do you see uh, AIDS as having impacted our culture our, and our art specifically, or your art um, and as a response or, or how did it serve as a kind of a prompt for you to uh, express yourself? Um, through your art. E.T., you kind of talked about that a little bit. Can you get us started maybe? Yeah, um, you know, I was thinking, this isn't exactly what you're asking, but I was thinking just a little bit ago how when AIDS, when we started getting a name for it and becoming aware of it in the 80s, it was killing people my age and younger then. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was, it was a youth, you know, it's something that, that really did affect uh, younger people. And now that I'm a senior citizen, this pandemic is killing people my age. Um, I don't know, it was just a random thought that sort of struck me. Um, that, that who is vulnerable has really changed in a lot of ways. But, um, what you want me to, oh, so how did AIDS affect my art? I, well, I, I kind of said it that 
I was just starting out as an artist and working on a publication that was really confronted with that, that pandemic. And so almost every issue had something about the impact of AIDS on different people. Um, and I, you know, I also was looking back through issues and there was one article that said, do lesbians need to have safe sex? I mean, that was at a time when we didn't know yet. We didn't really know um, who and how people were vulnerable completely. So I wasn't, explicitly drawing pictures that had to do with AIDS, but I was editing and curating work for the magazine that had to do with AIDS. And the, the, the portfolio I mentioned called 100 Legends, which is just this beautiful portfolio um, of all different kinds of art. And include in the, at the uh, opening, it includes um, a cassette tape for, wait, what just happened? I lost my screen. Um, sorry. <laughs> Hello? We're here. I, I have lost uh, the screen totally. Um, did you minimize it potentially? No. If you go down to your start menu, you should see a little zoom icon. You can bring that up. Somebody else should talk while I'm figuring this out. <laughs> this is embarrassing. Terry, you're muted. Please. Leo, can you talk to us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what's been interesting about this experience is somebody who's as old as the virus. I mean, I literally grew up with it. And after a very long time of dealing with it um, through puberty, through abstinence, um, education, and then as a 20 year old in San Francisco, and then as a 30 year old in New York, it's become such, it sort of became such a big part of my life on a daily basis, something to constantly avoid, something that was always the boogeyman for as long as I can remember, and something that I think educated my art in ways that I probably haven't grasped until the last five years. And lately, it sort of feels like there's this new thing all of a sudden that I have to think about and that we're all thinking about. And I think HIV sort of became the devil that I know such a long time ago. It, it sort of allowed me Facing the fear of HIV allowed me to create artwork that explored such big questions as, you know, what would the world be like if it didn't happen? And now I sort of find myself in such a similar situation of a lot of the activists that I read about, which is what happens when you're in a situation where there's this pandemic that a lot of people don't understand a lot of things about. There's a lot of misconceived, uh, there's a lot of preconceived notions of it or misconceptions of it. Um, it's all going to come down to testing and and government neglect and all of these weird reruns that have this echo from all the history that that I grew up reading. And so it's been really surreal and exhausting and, and sometimes just really frightening to be faced with something so similar. But I'll have these moments such as when I was trying to explain to my parents who are, you know, Mexican immigrants, that they they are one of the most vulnerable populations for this virus. And experiencing that anger and experiencing this process of educating them because there's so much bad information going on and this administration doesn't really care about their demographic. And I found myself sort of going back and imagining the anger that Larry Kramer had for so many years trying to educate people. And those are the things that I think are going to educate my artwork in the future, because right now it's such an excruciatingly present moment that is so scary, the insomnia is so bad, it's hard to make art through some of this. But I think what will be interesting to see is how we all deal with the PTSD that we're getting from this. And then when that art starts to, to come into fruition, I think is gonna be really fascinating. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, and I, and I, I'd love to hear some more about that. Uh, um, 
I guess interesting is not a great word, but I mean, I mean, we're dealing with the the emotional tidal wave of realizations of what's happening right now, and and I think as with AIDS, um, COVID is exposing as as a lot of people talk about, they're ex exposing the, in, the, the inequities, the injustices, uh, the most disadvantaged populations that are being impacted. Um, and in some cases, different communities than AIDS hit first, um, but you know, uh, uh, communities that are uh, uh, you know, needing our support, needing government attention and needing um, uh, what I want to say is really uh, creating anger, um, and and you spoke to that anger and fear, um, and how that sparked art. Um, sometimes it took time, I think, for that to really like spark um, the impetus to create an impetus for that creative impulse. Um, and sometimes I think it happens really quickly. Um, I think Leo, for you, you know, your 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 big passion project, uh, fathers. You know, it came later. I mean, I, I, when did you start working on that? Like twenty fifteen or sixteen, something like that. Um, so, um, uh, but did that also come from a, the anger, or is that more just like a reflection? Talk to me about that a little bit, if you would. Uh, the original idea for fathers came during the time when prep came out and there was so much cover uh there was so much community infighting and there wasn't i, I couldn't get us uh i couldn't get a straight answer from a lot of activists that i talked to this is about 2014. um even just six years ago there was a lot of confusion about hiv and our position and what our sex should be and what our art should be representing so even 30 years 35 years after the the you know, the birth of AIDS, I still had a lot of anger because there was no government education about it, even six years ago about what PrEP was. Um, it's never in anybody's best interest for gay men to have pleasurable sex. It's just part of being a gay man. It's, it's activists can't tell you just to go for it. You know, the uh, nonprofits, um, everything from government organizations to, you know, religious organizations, so I couldn't find somebody to, to tell me if it was okay to start taking this drug. And a lot of that anger and frustration made it into the project because it, it really brought home this idea that 30 years later, I could still not get the proper information and the proper support for what I needed, even in a city like New York. So a lot of that is, I don't think you can make art that has anything to do with the pandemic or AIDS and not have it have anger. And if you don't have any anger, then you're probably in a very privileged position. Mm -hmm. So, and it's yeah. very much the case with this. Yeah. Um, Lenora, in your portrait work, um, I, I, I know that in the uh, exhibit that you did, I think it was last year at the museum, um, there were some uh, some figures in it who had died from AIDS. Um, I, I'm thinking in particular of the couple, um, uh, the older couple, and I think his name was Mike, who came to the exhibit opening and it, uh, you're muted. I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that was Mike Hausch. Um, and he's still around, knock on wood. He lives around the corner from me. Um, and he was a um, legislative aide at one time. Mm -hmm. And uh, his partner in that painting um, was Rick Bakur, who was also involved uh, at City Hall. And he was at one point um, one of the presidents of the Harvey Milk Club. Uh, he has since passed on. But that particular painting was a sort of a 10 year anniversary of their relationship. And um, uh, at the time, I'm not even sure if we were aware that he had the virus. I mean, you know, a lot of people didn't really know then. I mean, even the other smaller one of the, the twins um, was done probably within a few years of the first one passing. So um, that was the other thing, you know, uh, we didn't always know who was sick and who wasn't until it became much more obvious. And I have to say that one of the differences between that pandemic and today's is that when people were 
visibly sick then, and they were able to get out and about, it was very noticeable, um, you know, their, their pallor, you know, if they'd lost weight and things like that. Today's pandemic, unless you're involved with somebody who's actually sick and in the hospital, it's, it seems more invisible. So I think that's one of the things that's not quite in your face and creates a sort of wall of denial for a lot of people that, you know, they don't think it's as severe as it really is. Mm -hmm. And I, and I find that um, it, it's frustrating because a lot of people aren't, really abiding by the the guidelines that are have been set by people who are you know trying to protect everybody you know yeah it's interesting uh, a lot of the ephemeral art um, that i've been seeing out on the street especially on the boarded up shops mm -hmm. um and you mentioned the castro theater i maybe i'll be able to pull up that mural but uh um they all feature masks you know yeah. masks on figures and so that there's a lot of messaging that's going on, on around that um, which is sort of a public service announcement, I suppose. And, I know, think it's a good idea. And actually that yeah. sort of replicates what people like Keith Haring were doing back in the day, you know, uh, and, and others like ACT UP, the artists who were in, involved with that. They were creating work. That, it, my, uh, it, exactly. They were creating work that could reach the, um, the public or their target audience in a way that maybe the stats, the dry science and all of those weren't reaching, the messages weren't getting out, the safe sex messages, all of that, a lot of people had to resort to creating graphic designs in order to get past, you know, the denial. Right. Yeah, and some of it uh, was uh, also, yeah, even safe sex messaging. I mean, there's the graphic arts posters and everything else that went through an evolution of um, becoming more and more graphic so that they would speak to people um, mm -hmm. in a way that was uh, uh, about their sexuality or uh, even drug use or something like that. But um, um, Joseph, you are, you know, you've done a couple of exhibits at Strut, you know, which is in Strut, uh, for people who don't know, is a pro program of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation on Castro Street. It incorporates um, uh, the uh, magnet uh, STD testing, HIV testing, as well as uh, the Stonewall Project, which is a harm reduction uh, program for uh, counseling program um, and, and other projects. But uh, as part of the Strut, uh, model. They wanted to create a community center that was engaging and included um, artwork. Um, and so, uh, uh, and in that way, you know, people would, um, you know, go go into the space, uh, go into the space, and, and sort of destigmatize. I think the idea of going in for, you know, HIV testing and counseling. And, and making uh, the safe sex part of our, our cultural conversation, if you will. So, so you've been a part of that. Um, how, how has it been doing openings at Strut of your artwork? Uh, well, this one, this last one was virtual, I understand, right? No, actually, oh, okay. um, I did get an opening on March 6th. Okay. And that was the, that was the day that um, I believe our mayor, um, had put out then um, regulations on the shelter in place, but uh, we did have that opening on March 6th. And then by March 7th, you know, we were all sheltered. So, um, I, you know, I just made it. Um, yeah, the, the image behind me is from that show and it's still up. So uh, normally they do a show every month with different queer artists. Um, but since they weren't able to host, you know, a reception for the artist. We couldn't bring a lot of people together to see it. Um, it's just been up there, which is fine with me because um, this particular like room, um, which they turned kind of into a gallery, it's their second floor area. And that's um, for their men's health services where people come in to get tested. And that is still open. So Strut is open, I believe, from Tuesday to Saturday, from 10 to four or so every day. So people are still accessing uh, that space. So people are having a chance to look at this as they're waiting, you know. Um, but overall, I mean, that's 
been very positive for me. You know, I've met a lot of people through that um, organization, you know, San Francisco AIDS Foundation um, is a sponsor of that and they've been doing it for, you know, over a decade. I'm not, I'm not quite sure because it used to be over at Magnet on 18th Street. Um, but, it, you know, it's a way for uh, the queer community to come together. And, and like you said earlier, they have a lot of different programs. They have programs for people with addictions. They have um, mental health programs. They have, um, you know, senior programs. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all really to help benefit um, the queer family's um, health in some way. And for me, it's been a great way to express myself and to find a community that kind of gets it right away. Uh, so they've been a great source for me to uh, come in contact with a lot of people. Great. And uh, E.G., I wanted to circle back um, with you because I think we have you back now, right? You can hear yes. us. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, you've done a couple of really great projects uh, uh, with the Historical Society. Uh, the last one was in, uh, uh, inspired by the Outlook magazine uh, from the 90s, where you connect uh, artists with um, uh, articles or poems or artwork that were in the original magazine and bring young artists in to sort of engage with those, uh, those pieces. Uh, and in particular with the Outlook uh, exhibit, it was, so it's an intergenerational kind of a project. Um, and with the Outlook exhibit, um, of course that was during the AIDS era. Were, was there any, anybody that was working or inspired particularly by um, any work that was around AIDS from, in that project? Yeah, quite a few actually. I, I, what I did was I, located physical copies of the all the issues of Outlook and uh, mailed, snail mailed each person a particular issue. And I think it, it, 38 people participated. So it ended up being about three people or two people per issue roughly. And, um, and since every issue had something about AIDS, A HIV in it, um, either directly or obliquely, um, there were a number of pieces. There were, there were people who wrote about it in relation to um, their connection to HIV from that era. Um, there was a video that um, somebody did in which they talked about missing the people they missed from that era. And those people, some of those were, were, were people that, that Andy knew by reputation. Some were people he'd met, some were people he'd gone out with. Um, and it, it, was, it was kind of a haunting video in which he um, evoked that present that is presence that is absent. Um, so yeah, it, it, um, the show was, was laced with things that referenced AIDS because it came out of that era. Yeah. Um, everybody was responding. The magazines went from 1988 to 1992. So yeah. everybody was in some way responding to something from that, that five-year period. Yeah, so uh, you know, I'm just flashing on, you know, 15, 20 years from now, somebody, some artist pulls together a project where they take, um, uh, news reports or magazine articles from the year 2020 and matches them with young people who didn't experience the COVID epidemic and create, says, go create some art that's inspired by these, by these publications. It'll be interesting to see what, how it's looked back on. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. We're in the middle of history being created. And so um, we don't know how this is going to be looked back on um, exactly, and in, in, uh, um, so history is is being created, and art is being created in real time in response to that. And I just kind of want to segue into Katie now. And uh, Katie, can you talk to us a little bit about what you've been working on in relationship to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I just mentioned that you know we're looking for safe and accessible ways of sharing art and that often that that is virtually now. Um, 
that's not as as accessible for older adults who are actually the most vulnerable to the virus that might not have access to technology or feel very comfortable with it. And in response to that, we created um, a live drag event for LGBTQ seniors. I briefly mentioned this at the end of um, the last event that we did together, but it's happening. I'm excited, on, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on May 22nd, and it's uh, also in, in collaboration with the GLBT Historical Society as part of Harvey Milk's 90th birthday celebration. Mm -hmm. And it's a collaboration with Open House, the museum and the Queer Nightlife Fund. And it's really this idea of a group of younger drag artists coming together to give a live show to seniors that have really been um, hit really hard and are kind of the most isolated right now. Um, and we're able to do it very safely because there's this courtyard that so many windows look down onto. And we're gonna live stream it as well so people can watch at home. And I do think that these kinds of innovations are, are the direction we're heading into for the next year or longer. Yeah, it's great that you're able to, um, and thank you for taking leadership on that. I think it's really inspiring uh, for a lot of people to see that uh, bringing art together with people that you know uh, need a lift right now in particular, but also just commissioning artwork, you know, I think is like really important right now, and especially Absolutely. people that people that are involved in light, nightlife. And I know Leo, you're involved a lot in nightlife work as well. And that was a crucial part of the idea as well, is we're gonna be able to financially support all these event producers and performers as well. I just wanted to share um, real quickly. So this is the, the mural that's in the progress on uh, the GLBT Historical Society Museum. And so Juanita Moore, who of course, who's the mother of us all, big drag queen, um, uh, connected me with Blake Cedric. And so he's doing something. I just said, I, I just commissioned him and I said, just do something that's queer and, you know, um, speaks to the moment, you know? And so I don't know what it's gonna be. <laughs> so, um, so uh, stay tuned. Um, Leo, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what's going on with uh, live artists and, and, and performance artists? I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, a whole lot of nothing. No, not really. Um, I think one of the most interesting parts of watching this has been how fast the nightlife community got in formation over this. Um, I think there's, uh, when we look at the, I think there's a temptation for older generations to sort of feel that we didn't pay a lot of attention to, to the AIDS crisis. And I was very concerned about my nightlife and performance community in the beginning, because I thought we were, we were prime to be decimated by this thing. And now we're realizing that the age that you can get really sick from this is actually much younger than we thought. Um, but everybody from here, to, I, I work in nightlife. So, I work with people that throw events in New York and Provincetown and New Orleans and, um, you know, as far as uh, Miami and uh, Austin. And what was really surprising to me in a really good way is how fast everybody took this seriously and how fast they sheltered in place. And that allowed a little bit of a buffering time that we all see was very crucial in the beginning. And while that was happening, a lot of these drag queens and performers and DJs really up their game on delivering online. I think one of the most interesting things that happens in the week is on the weekends, just in San Francisco, we do the Drag Alive show on Saturday and the quarantine dance on Sunday for the SF Nightlife Fund, which has been able to give out micro grants to a lot of artists like myself. Um, and so now when I turn on the TV, it's like, this whole show they've put together this incredible show now and these drag queens are really turning it out in their kitchens and their living rooms and being really clever and the djs are just going for it and you'll see like guys flagging in their living room and on paper it sounds a little sad but when you watch people have a good time and they're setting examples for other people I think a lot of us that are going through different waves of depression and anxiety, when we see somebody on the screen putting a lot of love into it, it's 
contagious in its own way. And it's brought me out of a couple of really dark moments to see that my sisters and my brothers are really just, you know, they're like, okay, this is what we're dealing with. And a lot of that's come from lessons from other epidemics, including one that I had forgotten about, which was the meningitis outbreak in New York City that we had uh, mm. around 2013, I think it was. And when I spoke to some of my DJ friends in New York, you know, I can hear the sirens in their headphones and, you know, so worried about in the beginning. And I said, you know, you guys should be a lot sicker than you are considering what you're dealing with and, and the shelter in place orders. And, and one of my favorite DJs, her name's Nita. And she said, no, we remember the meningitis outbreak of a couple of years ago. And once we even got whiff of this thing, we all just shut everything down. So it's mm -hmm. sort of a, it's a reminder of how resilient and vigilant our nightlife community is because a lot of our history has started in nightlife. You know, a lot of our AIDS activism started in nightlife and a lot of our, um, our early gay liberation stuff was intertwined with nightlife. So that's been a really, I think that's gonna be one of the sources of a lot of the best lessons of this epidemic is yeah. gonna be from our nightlife community. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'd love to see uh, something from, you know, see some writing from you on that. Cause I know that you- uh, I'm already working on it. <laughs> okay, good. And, and by the way, I do I'm wanna- I'm trying not to be so angry and freaked out. So it's yeah. taking a while. Yeah, I, I hear you, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and I do want to follow up with you, by the way, because, you know, it it is we're going into Pride season, and uh, as expected, I'm starting to get the media calls around the 50th anniversary of Pride, but also the corporations, they're like, yeah. oh, Pride is coming. Can you do something for our employee resource group? And I'm like, yes. Yeah, you know, how much money do you want to pay us? And then we'll, you know, put through a party or whatever. But we should actually talk because I have one possibility where they they that's what they want is a party I was like well can we do a history panel and they're like oh, you know. <laughs> um, so maybe a little bit of medicine and then you can have the, the party, yeah. you know but, uh, yeah but Lenora so you know what I'm thinking about you know I, I think of you as like because I've just gotten to know you in the last several years while I've, while I've been with the Historical Society and, and I've gotten to know your work over the last decades also a little bit, but um, I think of you as an observer. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you come and you, and you chronicle things um, and, you know, I, and then you throw it up online and you make it free for everyone to look at. And you, you, know, you come in and chronicle as an exhibit is going up and it's like fascinating. And, um, uh, and now you're not, you're not able to get out as much. I'm, I'm hoping not that- quite as before, but um, in addition to the, couple, the two very small walks that I took, um, just to keep a little sanity and get out of the house without having to run into people, yeah. Uh, and to keep my car going, because I don't want it to die on me when I might need it. I just, I take the car out and I go th out to the outer Richmond where I grew up and I go out to the beach. Now, when I first did this, um, there was nobody out there, you know, and it was very eerie again. And the great highway has been shut off where the parking area is because they don't want to encourage people to run down to the beach. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's been interesting because you see you know, how people are responding, whether they're wearing masks or not. Uh, so that, that's been really my only foray. And for those people who, you know, were wondering, well, you know, what are you doing? How, how are you doing uh, if you're not out doing your usual photography? But on occasions when I am able to pop out and take something, it's like for those who really are stuck and not going anywhere or whatever, all of a sudden, it's they kind of look forward to these little journals, picture journals, where at least they have something to look at besides the news. You know what I mean? And and sometimes it kind of prompts, you know, uh, uh, a little dialogue about what we're all going through and how everybody else is responding to that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it it really has curtailed my normal street photography. Well, the thing is that now we have. Um you know, more and more citizen journalists, if you will, you know, uh -huh. people that are just out with their phone, everybody's got a camera on them. Right. And they, and, uh, and they post stuff, you know, uh -huh. and, um, and I, you know, I, uh, I was doing a little bit of that and now I'm just sort of like, oh God, I'm just getting so fried on it. Um, 
let somebody else do it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, take pictures of chronicling, you know, what's going on and particularly I'm interested in the homeless. We have a panel next week, by the way, on the homeless situation, um, a, a fighting back panel looking at um, the COVID response um, and in relationship to what was done around homelessness with AIDS. But um, uh, uh, I'd love to see you get out there again. It, I mean, when you can, I mean, I'm, as I think we're learning more about how to mitigate risk, mm -hmm. you know, in going out, you know, that when it's a sunny day or when there's a nice breeze and you can wear a mask and all that kind of thing that, uh, and keep your distance that, you know, it may be possible to get out there without really running any risk at all. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing your COVID, <laughs> your COVID album. Um, so speaking of that, I want to pivot over to Katie, if I could, a little bit. And I'd love to hear about the show that you did that's really inspired by some of the shut-in uh, artists that we've got in our community in the Tenderloin in particular. Thank you. Yeah, I really wanted to let the artist's work um, speak for itself. So is everyone seeing my screen? Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, give me just a second to get some of my notes together here. Um, we're just going to go through a few of the pieces. Um, so this is by Kara Levine, and these are balloons strung up in her apartment building in LA, and they say, I cried listening to the news again. Um, so this is one of the more political pieces in our show, and it was actually conceived of before Shelter in Place. Um, it was inspired originally um, by previously horrible news stories like shootings, climate change, and child separation. Um, and for me personally, I feel like it makes a lot of sense that this was conceived of in the recent past, but has even more gravity now. Uh, because as unprecedented as it is what's happening, it certainly doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's a reason we got here. Um, and certainly what's happening right now is made worse by the unrelentingly ineffectual federal leadership that existed before. Uh, so I think Carol Levine's work really speaks to a continuity between what's happening now and what happened in the past to brought us here, uh, bring us here, excuse me. And uh, she's described it as the balloons share a private feeling in a public space. Um, which I'm going to use to segue into another work of art by Joe Kreider. And I'm just going to let this play. It's only a minute long, and then uh, we'll talk about it right afterwards. <laughs> This is the text we have for this piece. Um, Dancing on the roof during lockdown has become what Joe Kreider has called roof medicine, a way of healing through dance. Um, and doing so in this way that's closest to her practice as a site-specific choreographer. In the past, uh, Joe Kreider worked with the Tenderloin Museum to create Tender, um, which was a collaboration that took place on the Cadillac Hotel, which was aerial dancing about Tenderloin history. In light of the current situation, Kreider has expanded her tool set as an artist. I'm not a dance for a camera choreographer. That's not something I've dedicated skills and practices to, but I've learned, I'm learning what the camera sees versus what the audience sees. And as an artist cut off from audiences, I'm being called upon to expand my tools. I am one of many artists flexing new creative muscles to figure out how to stay in touch with our communities. 
So just moving right along to, this is Cal Cullen's artwork. Just flip through it. For social practice artist Cal Cullen, drawing on her grounding force and a natural response, drawing is her grounding force and natural response to the crisis. So she's been doing a daily drawing practice for a while and it's really shifted um, in related relationship to COVID. Um, she says, when things started shutting down, the drawings took a much darker and insightful turn. They relate directly to my experience of the day of, and things that I hear. And there's a lot of crazy mood swings between hopelessness for the future and grief and sadness for what's been lost. And I think that's happening everywhere in the world. And I personally really love this work. I love the juxtaposition between personal objects and thinking about larger political and social cultural issues. And I think the pandemic really has been affecting how we think about ourselves as members of society and our place in the world. And I, I really feel like that is reflected in this work. Um, just moving through real quickly to a couple other artists. This is uh, Rafael Cardenas. And he was actually also had a practice of taking a photo every day. And now that's really, um, co you can really see COVID more reflected in his work now. Um, and he was actually had an LA Times article about him recently that mentioned this show. And there's a quote also from our own local headline uh, where he said, creating art makes you feel productive in a peripheral way, like you are contributing to the world, even during all this. Sharing art makes you feel less lonely. So let's see, just wanna share two other artists. Um, I just feel like I've got to share Darwin Bell's photos. Um, public spaces that are nearly empty of people, I think are always going to be haunting visual representations of how profoundly our world has shifted. Um, he has a huge collection of photos as well. I can put a link in um, the chat, but Darwin says, if you're creative, there has to be an outlet. Taking photos of this strange landscape is exhilarating, but surreal and depressing too. He's a Tenderloin based street photographer who believes that artists have the will and the need to make the most out of devastating circumstances. With AIDS, especially queer artists turned a negative into a positive in a lot of ways. With terrible stuff happening, something beautiful has to come out of it. So just really quickly, one last artist um, I wanted to highlight Deirdre Weinberg, who's actually, um, she's a resident artist at the Tenderloin Museum, and we're working together on a future um, visual storytelling product project that's related the, to the pandemic. But this was the first piece we actually posted for this show. Um, and I love the acronistic imagery and how communicative it is it feels like we're living in plague times a lot of the time. Um, there's some strange haunting connection we're having to these time periods. And I mean, what we're living through in a, a global way hasn't happened since 1918. And we're kind of looking more to the past for clues more than ever, I think. And Deirdre herself described this piece as Blake inspired lino cut plate about the possibility of what America will become after COVID, either reformed or authoritarian state. And for Deirdre, creating this art was very therapeutic for her. Just the cutting, the rhythm of the cutting was such a soothing activity. Um, and she is a believer that creativity goes on even in the midst of a crisis and says, it's important to put something out in the community right now to show that not everything has stopped. So, on one last note, this is the most recent thing that we've posted on Shelter in Place, and it's also um, murals, public murals that Deirdre is doing um, on boarded up buildings. So I felt like that was a nice note to end on. Um, I think Deirdre's artwork is a great example of how art is both therapeutic for the artist and the viewer, and that it's often both personal and political, and that those things are by no means mutually exclusive. Oh, thank Thanks. you. I'm I'm so happy that um, you shared some of that with us, and especially some of the commentary and notes um, that you gave us. It's, 
really provoking a lot of interesting uh, questions for me. And, uh, you know, um, we have a little bit of time left and I wanna just like, sort of like ask you guys, anything come up for you in, in, in hearing uh, and seeing this particular show that you wanna talk about? I wanted to see more. <laughs> um, well, I'll put the link um, in the chat and um, there's, yeah, there's quite a bit more and we're gonna continue the show um, as we continue to quarantine. <laughs> yeah, let me just Wonderful. say, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the urgency of the moment, um, the, the role of art in, in politics and in social change um, what kind of world we're going to be at the other side of this epidemic um, and how art is going to help to shape that, you know, or respond to that. I, I, I feel like, you know, I mean, you can write a political treatise and post it or a manifesto of some kind and, or, uh, you know, lobby a, an official, or you can make a painting or a mural or something like that. And, and you know, how does that collective kind of artistic response um, influence what kind of world we're going to be? Um, so I see those kinds of questions coming up a lot in, in that show. And, um, and I'm just thinking, um, what, what do you think about that, Leo? About what part exactly? Art. The role of... What the urgency, the urgency of the moment and how art is responding to that. I, I mean, when I think about... Oh, I, right. Um, I think, well, I think one of the biggest themes of this entire pandemic has been a delay you know like we don't know the results of anything until two weeks we don't know how long like everything has been on that's why our time is so screwed up so i don't think that personally i felt such a pressure in the beginning when we had this first panel of creating all this stuff and pivoting and there was all this talk about pivot you got to pivot in your art and your career and how you're gonna make money um and i think once i realized that we're so in the present of this thing and we we have no sense of the scope of it we literally don't have a sense of the amount of infections um i think for me i had to take a step back of the pressure of creating art about covid and concentrate on my food photos <laughs> and jazz and you know i decided to create a series of mixtapes of relaxing jazz for my friends and have little screening sessions and i have put an embarrassing amount of time into my food photography on Instagram. And when I'm dealing with that and sort of calming my brain down a little bit as much as I can, then some of the themes that are possible about COVID start to sort of rise to the top. And my place as, a, as an immigrant seeing, you know, one of the things that's developing is that I come from a people that are going to bear the brunt of this epidemic. Um, what is that going to mean to me later? Well, right now my main focus is making sure that my parents are okay. And I've had moments that I thought, well, you know, if this took both of my parents, how would my art look? How angry would I be? Or, you know, how can I create art that's about public, you know, discourse about it? But in the meantime, it's just waiting, which that's difficult for artists because I think we're used to getting an idea and sitting down, banging it out. I think a lot of people that um, especially live in cities like this sort of have to get into that speed. But for right now, it's just a matter of letting this horrible Polaroid develop and these states reopening and what that's gonna look like at the end of the summer. So I think for a lot of artists, the pressure to say something about COVID is so present, but we sort of have to take it two weeks at a time, which is really frustrating. So it really limits the the scope of what we can do, but I think the, the amount and the quality of the art that we're going to see later on is gonna be its own sort of renaissance and it's gonna be coming from these really dense cities. So I'm, I'm really curious about that, but for now, um, I'm just trying to take it one day at a time, which sounds really cheesy, but it's really no, all I we mean, can do. No, I, I mean, I don't think so at all. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you are creating things, even if it's pictures of food. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, maybe sometimes um, the repetition of a process yeah. 
as you well, I think refer what, to. For, for me, one of the biggest lessons of this is, you know, I lost my job. I do filmmaking for events. So I watched those cancellations back in the beginning of April, just go through the end of the year. Um, but I realized that I can't live a day without making art. I just can't do it. It either, mm -hmm. e either if it's a, a beautiful plate or a jazz mix or whatever, I am built that way. And so mm -hmm. it's just been reaffirming. And I think a lot of artists are gonna get this reaffirmation that even if you're not doing it for work or you're not doing it for the reasons that you normally did, mm -hmm. creating art is a necessity for someone who calls themselves an artist. And I think not in a negative way, but I think a lot of this pandemic will be able to sort of not weed out the real artist because that sounds elitist, but I think it's gonna show people Mm. the kind of artist that they are given yeah. all this time and given all this solitude yeah so you this know, in, an odd, in an odd kind of way i feel like the pandemic is um is featuring um ordinary people's approach to art more than it is big lavish art productions that we normally go to museums for and artists who have assembly line workers working for them to create these big lavish productions, but instead, you know, it's it's sort of people working in this the really kind of immediate way that you're talking about, Leo, and mm -hmm. and very personal. Like, you know, since I'm locked in my house, I spend a lot of time walking around my neighborhood, which is not a gay neighborhood. It's the Bayview. And I am getting to know my neighborhood in a way that I didn't. And I'm writing about it and mm -hmm. writing about my relationship to it. And it just feels, I don't know where it's going, but it it I, you know, I write something every day and it's, um, it, it feels, there's, I, I think the immediacy of the art being produced is gonna be innovative in a, in a certain kind of way. Yeah, and E.G., you know, uh, one thing that came up for me in looking at uh, Katie's show and particularly the piece that was sort of reminiscent of the plague years of the Middle Ages, the Black Death, um, and really evoked um, you know, the, the history of, of that, um, that we all kind of like grew up with sort of knowing and, and, I, and, uh, and the art that kind of emerged from that also, I think. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, what role is sort of the historical references um, uh, playing right now? And I think about the 1918 epidemic a lot and, and uh, do a little bit of reading about how we responded to that as a society, but I don't know too much about the art. But yeah, as Katie said, you know, people are going back and, and, and looking to see, you know, what impacts did an epidemic have? Um, and, uh, uh, and in particular with art, um, how do you think that's gonna, how, 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 how are we gonna respond to this historically, do you think? Uh, Joseph, maybe I'll kick over to you. Okay, I wanted to share something. Um, this, this is a piece of art I recently did and um, it's called Face Mask. Um, mm. And it's kind of just the reverse of what we're seeing, you know, on the streets right now. But for me, it was about expressing, you know, that longing that, um, you know, queer men have or anyone has to be with other people. But um, so I've kind of inverted this kind of um, view of the face mask um, to really speak to kind of like the longings that we have right now. Um, so that's kind of like how I'm interpreting some things right now in my mm -hmm. own work. Yeah. Um, so you know, as, as a, oh, Katie, I don't know, as, as an art, um, as an administrator, as an executive and a fundraiser for a, a cultural organization, um, you know, I feel a certain responsibility, you know, uh, for um, sort of, um, um, you know, nurturing the organization and the people that uh, help to, you know, do research and create art from our archives and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm concerned, you know, where are we gonna go? Uh, we're seeing like these huge budget cuts uh, coming, um, a, a recession, if not a depression. Um, and uh, nowhere 
or, you know, in a small sense, as somebody posted, I think in the chat, you know, that there are resources that are coming through for cultural organizations um, that are kind of like COVID response stimulus money, but it's really peanuts compared to what we're losing. Yeah. Um, well, that's we're, a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it is tough. I mean, you know, and, and this came up last time too. And I think Leo talked about it. It's like, you know, people are trying to pay their rent right now. And, you know, how does anyone even have the time to think about you know, art, and I think that's changing a little bit, um, you know, yeah, but. I, mean, I think that, I mean, there have been a, an incredible amount of resources from foundations um, during this time period. Um, the city as well has really stepped up and given to the arts. I mean, obviously, like you just said, we're heading into a recession or depression and there's a ton of unknowns there. Um, yeah. I mean, from what I'm hearing so often from artists right now is that this is our chance to reimagine a new world. And I think that the arts is what we need to reimagine a new world. It's always what we need. And I mean, chaotic situations can lead to great change <laughs> and the arts is and cultural organizations have been very underfunded and unvalued mm. by this country. So, I mean, potentially that's like a very lofty, optimistic statement, but this is our chance to potentially to really make some changes. Yeah, around a lot of stuff. You yeah. Know? And I mean, the things that, you know, Bernie Sanders was talking about during the presidential campaign, which were just a little out to the left. Now yeah. they're like, well, that's what we got to do in order to, you know, deal with the homeless crisis. I think you know? it feels really important now more than ever. I mean, we're doing, speaking of the homeless crisis, it, it always was a public health concern. Right. And now it's just like a public health catastrophe that's finally like, we have the resources to get these people inside. Let's do it. Um, yeah. So I and mean, similarly, lots of things, you know, including funding the arts. Yeah, and you know, I mean, when I, when I was a kid, you know, a teenager, I was I, I was a junkie on science fiction, and that's partly why I love Leo's project, which is a, sort of an alternative reality, alternative future. Um, and I just see, like, um, you know, uh, you know, somebody, people are going to be producing. Like, let's let's imagine this alternative future. Um, as we're in the process of creating it, you know. Um, but then there's the other force to let's just go back to normal. Let's, you know, like, let's just, you know, open up the shops and, and try to make it as much as like as it was before um, economically and socially. So I think, yeah, there's a role for artists there in particular to push, push and say that we don't have to do that necessarily. Um, but uh, um, uh, Leo, what do you have in mind? Or is, is there a project coming to imagine um, post COVID or what COVID, COVID could do. I thought about how funny it would be if in like 20 years or 15, somebody else was like, let's pretend COVID never happened and what would the world look like? <laughs> so that's been kind of interesting to yeah, yeah. like, how would I feel about that? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I think for me, what's more interesting is how we're going to have to sort of meld art and costume and nightlife. I mean, gay people, queer people always find a way to gather. That's one of the things that's in our history that's constant. There's always, no matter if there was air raids in Berlin or the height of the AIDS epidemic, uh, we always managed to sort of congregate. Um, I think what sort of gets me excited, if I can get excited, about anything about this is, for example, you know, I texted my brother who's a costume designer and I told him like, are you already thinking of things we can wear, you know, to make sure that like some spikes that come out of your neck? I've got some prototypes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, or, you know, he lives in New Orleans and I, it's, just, it's like my second home and I'm thinking, you know, I could see a plague doctor parade, you know, where we're, or, or, Exactly, or furries had the right idea maybe this whole time. Like, I think <laughs> that is, right? So I think yeah. that is where a lot, of, right. a lot of the art and a lot of the innovation I think might come from a lot of artists that I know is how do we raise funds to get, you know, so much of this is dependent on the testing thing, but let's say we do figure that out. 
for mm-hmm. ourselves. And what is that going to look like? What's an art show going to look like? You know, yeah. we're, there's, we're not going to be in a room together with strangers for a really long time. And this is probably going to be a five-year exercise the way that the government has really dropped the ball on it. So it's going to be up to us to sort of write about these. It's, we're about to take a really sci-fi turn in how we have to view what our gatherings look like. And is it a matter of, you know, d- does a screening look like, you know, 10 people that have been quarantining with another 10 people on Zoom and all of a sudden you have a thousand people for a show. Is that what that looks like, you know? Um, yeah. Do we have to invest in better, uh, as artists, do we have to invest in better TVs, better sound systems? Like, I need what a is... better camera, that's for sure. I think I'm looking really <laughs> good right here. And I mean, <laughs> I have my, that's one of the things that I've been using for my, uh, all my food photographies, I have these, movie lights that are just sitting here painfully looking at me not oh, making wow. me any money so yeah. i have my nice my nice light set up in my kitchen and yeah right now so yeah. i think i think what we're going to have to concentrate very very this is going to be a very long exercise and it's going to have to be very gradual for us um and you know, i think we're going to figure it out it's yeah. weird we're getting to see into everybody's homes in a way that mm-hmm. we never did mm-hmm. i mean total strangers um it, i mean all the yoga classes happening in somebody's living room where they're yeah you know, there's I twitter mean, uh there's twitter accounts dedicated to the cats of the news anchors on the pbs news hour uh, that's how bored <laughs> people are but that's how much they're paying attention and i think those things are going to be the stuff that the art is going to come out of it's like yeah, a yeah. refreshing shake up of professionalism too that needed to be shaken up Right. And so like accessibility for people with disabilities as well. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, I think that there is that that potential, you know, that the, the existing societal structures and the uh, different stratas of uh, society that we have are getting shaken up. But at the, on the other hand, it, there's a danger that they're going to be crystallized, that the poor will continue to become poor and the rich will, you know, run off, run off with a bank. And, um, you know, and I think there's, there's that tension there that's definitely happening. But I wanted to say last week, we, our panel was on sex. Um, and, uh, you know, sex is uh, and sexuality and uh, um, uh, being positive about our sexual identity um, is very much a part of queer culture and of, of queer art. Um, and, we're trying. We're we're trying to figure out sex right now. You know, um, uh, uh, I think everybody is if they're sexually active. Um, and uh, um, I, I wonder. You know, I wonder if we can, in our last few minutes, maybe um, just talk about like, if anybody has any comments about what's specific about queer um, queer life um, that is going to affect. Um, you know, our psychology and, 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 and our relationships and, and how that's going to relate to people's art. Uh, I know that sounds kind of vague, but, um, you know, I was thinking about like, I mean, there's Zoom meetings for, for sex, there's FaceTime sex for people that, and there's people getting across the room from each other. Um, and I think those are such interesting topics, you know, to see, to, to look at how that's going to happen. Are, are people going to go back to the parks and have sex outdoors, you know, because it's safer? <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> um, bring it back. Um, you know, what, how are we going to tell this story? I don't know. My desires are very modest. I'm like, when am I going <laughs> to touch somebody again? Okay. Well, I, mean, I live alone. When am I going to hug somebody again? Yeah. I think the hugs is the most important part hugs. we need to get back to. I think furry costumes for everybody designed by local artists and indigenous people <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and then we have a furry hug party. That is a <laughs> That'd be my art piece. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. believe me, I've been thinking about it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a whole mask collection, actually. You know, it'd be interesting. It's, we also get to be somewhat anonymous when we walk around, you know, um, uh, which is kind of fun and sexy, um, wearing, wearing a mask. Um, uh, sort of androgynous even. Um, Joseph, your sex is a big part of your, your art. I see behind you, there's some mm-hmm. very erotic images there. What are you thinking? What's, what's COVID gonna do to your art? Um, well, it, it may help um, 
people with their with their own personal i mean if they're viewing it they may relate to um uh, some of them are couples some of them are individuals but you know i i was thinking about the difference between aids and how we had safe sex and we could put a condom on it and we could we could still have that personal touch now that we have to maintain social distancing. We don't have that e ability to really touch anymore. So that's going to kind of, I think, change the way um, we relate to one another. You know, um, I have conversations with with some people online um, in some different like sex chat rooms, and it's it's really just everyone kind of waiting for the day when they can get together but it's just so it's just not known right now you know until a, a vaccine comes out and yeah you know but, but there are stories there that will that will be told i mean you know they're they're being crafted right now but we're still writing the story i saw an article in the new york times i think six weeks ago or so i didn't even get past the headline but it was the headline was if you are thinking about writing the COVID book, don't, you know, don't do it yet. I mean, let's wait for the COVID book. Don't rush to your publisher and try to get an advance. We, you know, let's, let's figure out what the story is. I think that um, makes a lot of sense, but if I could just interject really quickly. Yeah. It is interesting though, that when I watch movies and TV, sometimes I feel like I can't relate to anything happening because they're <laughs> not going through it and they're all <laughs> touching each other. And <laughs> So yeah. as much as like it is weird. way too early to write the book, maybe it's not too early though to do some kinds of fiction about it because I need characters I can relate to. Reality TV. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, we're doing it right now. This is going to be art, right? It's, this is going to be recorded and put on our website. Um, so this is a little bit of reality TV, which is um, an obscure art form that Donald Trump mastered. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Lenora... Lenora, I just have a question here um, that just yeah. came in and we have like one minute left and I just want to like throw it out. Maybe you have a response to this, but um, in terms of disabled artists, um, uh, you know, disabled artists have frequently been working, you know, at home or, or whatever. Um, you know, what is the role? How can we lift up their voices uh, um, during the COVID? epidemic in particular. Do you have any thoughts on that in particular? I'm kind of stumped, but actually there was a woman who is um, uh, disabled. I, I can't recall what her particular disability is. I mean, she is ambulatory, but she's very short. Um, and I saw some kind of a profile on her uh, where she was doing an exhibit and she actually did, um, I think her name is Reva Lehrer. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but um, she used to focus primarily or, or exclusively on uh, disabled subjects, you know, very detailed renderings. Uh, but her most recent um, image was a, um, a piece that she did of Alison Bechtel, the, um, the novelist cartoonist who used to do um, Dykes to Look Out For. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, and so um, I don't know about others, though. Yeah, you know, you know what? That that was a big question. We could do an in, entire forum on that question. And thank you for to the person who sent it in. And what I'll promise you is that we'll do an entire forum uh, on this, and in the coming weeks, uh, specifically around you know the impacts on uh, disabled people in relationship to the COVID crisis. And with that, guys, we're out of time and I just wanna thank you all so much for your participation in tonight's forum, coming back. We're gonna, um, will you all come back and do this again? Because I think it's really interesting to sort of like chronicle the progress in our thinking and our observations around art and COVID and AIDS. So um, with that, I'm gonna say, wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye, night. See you guys. Bye. Stay safe.